My name is Lori Frederick. I'm the director of the Latin American Studies Center. Um, we are, we've invited, we're very happy to have Dr. Greg Downing here today along with the departments of anthropology and physical cultural studies. So thank you all for, for coming out to support. So you're from a lot of different groups and I'm sure we'll have a lot of um, varied questions. We will have a Q&A afterwards as well as a live demonstration of capoeira um, and music. So, and, and our musicians and our practitioners are back here. And hopefully we can um, entice Dr. Downing Stay limber, to, guys. to Stay get limber. in there. Yes, <laughs> they're, gonna be, they're also going you. to be no. teaching you a few of the moves. <laughs> so anybody who would like to after sitting for an hour and being um, very mind driven can get up and, and learn a few of the capoeira moves as well. Okay. Um, Dr. Downey is an associate professor and head of the Department of Anthropology at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. Dr. Downey has done field research on sport in Brazil, Australia, Australia and the United States, and he also researches and writes about rugby, mixed martial arts, as well as the senses, um, and a lot of really interesting new innovative work that he is doing. So uh, uh, hopefully you will be able to, to look at his other work as well. He's a, the co-founder and regular writer for Neuroanthropology, which is a web, uh, web blog at the Public Library of Science, and he will provide the, um, the site for you, actually, if you can see that right there, if you're interested in that. Um, we do have, if, again, if you, you know, you're enjoying kind of the, the combination of intellect and, and action, um, which is what we'll be talking about today, the Latin American Studies Center is hosting a Latin dance social on December 10th from 6 to 8. We'll be having a short lesson. That's, we'll not be talking at all. It'll just be about dancing and having fun and end of semester. So please come and join us if you'd like. So without further ado, welcome Greg Downey. Thank you all for coming. Thanks also to Latin American Studies Center, to the Department of Physical Culture, to the Maryland Capoeira folks. Thanks guys for coming. And um, I'll do. I'll try to talk. I'll keep an eye on my time. I'm going to start my stopwatch here, and I'll keep it down to about 40 to 45 minutes. And um, if I go long, you guys give me a hot data. Just knock me down. Um, but I'll try to keep this short because I do. It's a fun topic, and I'm going to move across a variety of issues as I go. So if I can kind of yeah, that's great. I want to start with this song. Um, I'll just read the English. Hail, hail the nation. Hail the Brazilian nation. Hail Princessa Isabel, oh my Deus, oh my God, who delivered me from captivity. This song is an artifact of disorder. It's a fragment of history of Capoeira sung to accompany the contemporary practice that's going to take about 20 minutes to explain the full meaning of this song. I'll come back to it. And then I'm going to talk at the end about why this matters for the brain and for how movement and, and brain interact in interesting ways in different cultures. On its surface, this text is actually fairly simple. The song celebrates what Brazilians call Le Oria, the Golden Law, which is the, it was emancipated the last slaves in Brazil in 1888. Um, as Laura and I were discussing, the second to last country in the Western Hemisphere to outlaw slavery. Only Cuba had slavery longer. This law was passed by Princess Isabella. Um, the song were similar verses. Capoeira songs are often improvised, so they often have flexible structures, so you can sort of modify them as you go. Is sung by is sung at different times by practitioners of the Afro-Brazilian martial art capoeira. I'll show you some old videos in a second, as well as some contemporary stuff to accompany the game. The texts and references to Leoria, however, this law, um, are increasingly controversial among practitioners of capoeira. In fact, critics have even composed sort of antithetical verses, verses that go against this verse, saying, you know, what is this about this golden law? I still see inequality. I still see racism. You know, Princess Isabella didn't do anything for us. So you sort of get fighting happening in the music. Now this particular version of the verse is special in Capoeira's political history. I'll go ahead. This is, in case you're wondering, that's my sort of guide to pronouncing, pronouncing the word. Um, this particular version of the verse is special in Capoeira's political history because it's attributed to this guy, Mr. Kanjikinho, who passed away while I was there in the 90s. Um, a traditional teacher of Capoeira in the city of Salvador. And I think I have a map. Yes, that shows what Salvador is. Let me talk about Salvador and Rio. Um, he sang it at the first regional seminar of Capoeira and the Festival of Rhythm of Capoeira, which was held in 1981. Now, that's a watershed event in the history of Capoeira because it's arguably the moment in which there was a kind of revival of traditional Capoeira. Up until 1981, people thought Capoeira, the traditional forms of Capoeira were going to die. They're going to be replaced entirely by modernized or contemporary forms of Capoeira, um, especially ones that have been adopted to be more like sport. So there was a movement to make Capoeira into a sport, and this was kind of the, 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 back, the backlash began by the sort of folklore versions of Capoeira, or the ones that were sort of more cultural. At the seminar, this important seminar in 1981, some of Bahia's Capoeira masters, 
these old guys who played, clashed openly with representatives of the Movimento Negro Unificado, this organization, or the United Black Movement. The United Black Movement was a black nationalist, a political organization based on the Black Panthers and some of the civil rights organizations in the United States that was arguing for sort of a racial identity and equality in all kinds of ways. And they went to this thing thinking that Capoeira would be a great ally because Capoeira was an art of the oppressed and the mess just got angry. They didn't like this reading of what they were doing. MNU members argued that the Crown's abolition of slavery in 1888, the Golden Law, and Princess Isabella were a cynical ploy um, by monarchists to gain allies. A formal legal maneuver, it was a legal maneuver that really didn't change the condition of Afro-Brazilians. It was a hollow thing, it's still, the, they were poor. These activists consider the anniversary celebration on May 13th of this law that I was mentioning to be a kind of distraction from the real racial problems that still bother Brazil to this day. The inequality and, and um, especially uh, pre, uh, you know, sort of prejudice against people with dark skin. The darker your skin, the more African your features, the more people are prejudiced against you in Brazil. The, the commemoration, the MNU is arguing, um, is symptomatic of how legitimate complaints of racism are stifled in Brazil by an official language or official discourse of equality and racial democracy. And their symbol the symbolic actions are, are taken over real effective political, social, and economic change. So in the midst of the seminar and over the objections that MNU, Mr. Ken Shikin rose up and started singing this song. Just burst out singing in the middle of the thing. And all of the other Capoeira practitioners who were also irritated, it was a small minority, started singing along with them and they were drowning out the speakers. And eventually, according to the story that I heard, he led a bunch of these people out of the auditorium, singing this song and playing instruments and sort of said, Capoeira and what you're saying are not, they're not related. Now, it's interesting, uh, there's a lot, it was a moment of confrontation, I would argue, between two different understandings of, of the struggle for equality and the struggle for liberation. One argument is for resistance, that black culture is inherently resistant, and one is a different argument. I would say it's an argument of disorder that comes out of Capoeira. That is, Kenya represents a view that, um, and, and, and he sort of enacted it by throwing the whole thing into disarray, that one of the ways to get ahead is by throwing things into confusion by asserting your power, not by necessarily unifying yourself and fighting against oppression. So I turn to the song because if you know how to hear it, the song also makes another claim, which is the song links contemporary Capoeira practice to the 19th century, to the 1880s and to earlier, to the gangs of people called Capoeiras. Now I know this is gonna be confusing. There are people called Capoeiras and there's, a, and there's an art called Capoeira. Um, and they sort of changed over time. It used to be, Capoeiras, and, and today we call the practice Capoeira, we call the people who do it Capoeiristas. So it'll be confusing. I'm going to try to make it a productive confusion. The Capoeiras were gangs of underemployed men in Brazil. This is it. Um, gangs of unemployed men in Brazil city, especially Rio de Janeiro, many of them slaves, former slaves, or their descendants. Throughout the 19th century, historian Carlos, uh, Eugenio Lavana Suarez, Carlos Suarez, says that they were the privileged target of the violence of the state. They were the scourge of those, he's, that's his word, scourge, of those responsible for maintaining order in the Brazilian Empire and later in the Republic. And as they were the biggest problem for the police for over a century, that these guys were the biggest problem. The thing that's interesting, that I, reason I call that disorder and rather than resistance, is because the song celebrates the way that Capoeiras actually aligned themselves with groups in power and were part of what kept those groups in power. That is, they weren't just being downtrodden, they were actually going on the offensive, and they were a dangerous and, and, and valuable resource that politically leads tried to use against each other. So they would play off the gangs. Kind of imagine, this is about the same time period, by the way, as you watch the movie Gangs of New York. Um, and I think most of us didn't realize just how turbulent urban life was in the 19th century. Brazil was the same way. So they weren't just persecuted, they were also powerful. In other words, the gangs were an important political player even though they emerged from some of the most marginalized, discriminated against groups of people in Brazil. That's the reason I call them disorderly, and I use the word um, in Portuguese, desorderos, um, which is kind of means a disorderly, a person who brings disorder. Um, and that's what they're still called to this day sometimes, desorderos. They, they break things up of events, they cause chaos. The presentation I'm gonna give it in the first part, in the first half, let me make sure I got my time here, I'll keep track of things. Um, 
seven minutes, 47 seconds, we're good, uh, is actually a kind of dispute I've been having with a guy named Arjuna Potterai um, since I was a grad student. Uh, at the time, Arjuna Potterai was giving lectures of a book that became very important, which his book is book on the anthropology of, of modernity, basically, on the anthropology of globalization. And in it, he has a whole story about decolonization. And my argument with, with Arjun is that if you understand decolonization, if you understand emancipation from the point of view of England and, the Amer and America, the United States, you miss how varied it was in the Caribbean, in Latin America, in Africa, in all kinds of places, in Australia. It's quite a different pattern. And the pattern in Brazil is actually really interesting. Um, because Brazil was an emerging superpower in the 19th century. It could have made it. Arguably, the only reason it didn't was because of the dictatorship that came in after that and the disorder. Um, so Brazil, the decolonization was really messy and involved some really strange and fleeting alliances between groups of people that you wouldn't think would ever wind up on the same side fighting together. The order and forms of disorder that got produced during de decolonization, emancipation, or other type of political change depend upon what the order was in the first place. So how did it start? Well, African slaves uh, were first brought to Brazil after the papal bull, the papal, the papacy end, issued the bull of 1537 that, pro that forbid the enslavement of Indians. So in 1537, Indians are no longer allowed to be enslaved, so the solution was not to get rid of slavery, the solution was to find other slaves. So starting in 1537, the Portuguese and the Spanish began transporting Africans to the New World because they were no longer allowed to imprison the Indians. Now that accelerated, especially at the, at the beginning of the 1580s when sugar was established as the primary industry. So 1580s, I mean this is really early in the history of the New World. 1580s, a slavery starts to accelerate, accelerate. And overall, over the course of the next, well basically over three centuries, 40% of all the Africans who were brought to the New World were brought to Brazil. So 40% of the entire <coughs> slave trade went to Brazil. By contrast, the US got around 17%, I think is what the usual figure is. So an enormous number of Africans were transported to Brazil and sold into slavery primarily to work in the mines, the sugarcane fields, things like that. There, the life expectancy was so bad, it dropped at some points to, to if you were an African enslaved, you had a life expectancy of 23 years. You would die on average by the age of 23. In some cases, the life expectancy in the colony had dropped to three years. So you're, you're, if you were living longer than three years, you were beating the odds if you were a slave. Conditions were atrocious. And it's important to point out the, the scale and the endurance of slavery. Slavery was an institution in Brazil from its founding, so the 1500s when that papal bull was issued, until the 1880s, over 300 years of slavery in the country. By contrast, it's been free for less than half that. So if you think about it, Brazil was a slave state longer than it's been a free state, more than twice as long. So um, now during this 400 years, African and Brazilian born slaves fought the, the slaveocratic order in a variety of ways. Some of them fled into the hinterlands. They set up communities of escaped slaves called quilombos, um, which exist to this day. I mean, some of the most interesting quilombos though are actually within city limits. Because it turned out that you could flee slavery by just fleeing into slums that, where the masters wouldn't chase you. So some of the quilombos around Rio, for example, are actually quite close to the city. Um, and those are traditional slave communities. They also engaged in some uprisings, such as the Muslim Align Revolt of the Malays, was led by West African Muslim slaves in 1835. And it's one of the reasons why Brazilian uh, slave owners stopped wanting any slave who might be Muslim, because they were afraid of the ability to, to they had to communicate. Um, and some Capoeira practitioners today like to talk about these, like the Quilombos and the revolt, as though they were part of Capoeira history, but there's no evidence of a link between Capoeira and these events. There is, however, a link, especially in Rio, between this, these gangs. And that's why I think it's so interesting. Um, it appears that Capoeira was born in Rio out of a different kind of disorder, not out of escaped slaves, but out of a slaveholding society that leaked people constantly. So it was a... Um, the idea that I think modern practitioners have that the slavery was in a struggle for freedom is only partially true, because some of the people who were doing it were already quite free. So what do I mean? Uh, well, Brazilian slavery was plagued by constant escape, evasion, and lack of oversight. In Brazil, large numbers of Africans achieved legal freedom long before abolition was actually enshrined. About 20 to 30 percent of the African population of Rio in the early 19th century was freed slaves. They had already gotten their freedom. Um, by the time of abolition in 1888, more than three quarters of all blacks in general, that is not just African-born Africans, but also Brazilian-born Afro-Brazilians, had already gotten freedom. So most people were already free by the time of the abolitionists. And they, some of the, in some cases, they had purchased their own freedom 
um, especially through cooperative arrangements. They would actually establish, you could call them almost buying clubs, where they would pool their money and then draw lots to whose freedom they would buy. So you know, you'd contribute money and then there'd be 12 of you and you put enough money in and each year you'd buy somebody's freedom until everybody was free. And some of those were linked to Catholic orders. But sometimes they'd be freed on the death of the master. The master would actually, as a you know, sort of reward for loyalty, and especially if, if the, the, slave, the slave person might be his or her son, would often free the slave as a part of that. So the orderly division between enslaved African and slaveholding European was not historically accurate. I'm going to some, put some more pictures up. I should just skip over. This just shows where slaves were coming from. So this orderly division that we see in this picture from the plantation in the cities broke down in all kinds of ways. Um, by the 19th century, Brazilian historian Eduardo Franza Peva estimates that a third of all slaves were actually owned by ex-slaves and their descendants. So slaves, ex-slaves were owning slaves. So a totally different dynamic. Slaves were band banding together, purchasing their freedom. In addition, free Portuguese and other European laborers often worked in crews alongside slaves also winding up involved in the same gangs, informal work. So there were actually freed men who weren't even, uh, they, they, were never, they were never enslaved, who were joining these organizations that the, the, the Afro-Brazilians themselves were creating. So the Portuguese, for example, and surveillance of slaves, especially in cities, could also be quite poor. This is a, one of the earliest pictures of what we think might have led to Capoeira. This is a, and you see the, the soldier climbing over the fence. This is from a wood carving um, based on a French traveler's accounts of traveling in Brazil. Surveillance of slaves, especially in cities, could be quite lax. One of the primary occupations of teams of slaves was as porters, that is, they'd move about the city carrying cargo before there were trucks, and the owners would often not have any oversight of this at all. They would often have to check in once a week, and they'd be responsible for turning over a certain amount of money to the owner, but they were basically contractors. They were contract slaves who would contract themselves out. They were what we call negros de ganho, or slaves for hire. Um, and so some Negros de Ganya didn't check in for days um, or sometimes even longer, weeks or months. And this was, a, in, the, in other words, a view of history is clearly dividing the dominated from the dominating along racial lines breaks down, a view sometimes attributed to the, the MNU, the Movimento Negro Unificado, that group. Um, it fails to capture the kind of disorder that was inherent in this urban life. Now, it got a lot worse, and this is my last bit of history before I sort of wrap up. I'm going to keep track here. In 1807, um, in 1807, this is where Brazilian history gets really interesting. Um, Napoleon was romping around the Iberian Peninsula, conquering Spain, attacking Portugal. So the Portuguese crown was transferred to Rio. So the Portuguese royal family was transported by the English. 15,000 people were taken to Rio. Now this meant that they arrived in, in the seat of what was then the imperial viceroy, that is the, the colonial capital. But the only reason the colonial capital was there was because Br Por Portugal was losing control of its colony. It moved the capital from Salvador down to Rio because people were smuggling so much gold that they had to try to get their capital somewhere near the route of the smugglers to try to control it. So you imagine it's the Wild West and suddenly the king shows up with his entire court and says, I'm now, the capital of the Portuguese empire is now in Rio, which was like the Wild West before. So you get 15,000 people connected with the vice royalty, moved to Rio to try to, um, and at the time, a th between a third and a half of all the inhabitants were slaves. And this was very scary to the, the owners and to the people who were running the colony because suddenly they're living in a city that's basically a police state. So they have to establish a police force for the first time. Um, in fact, at the time, it may have been the largest captive population of Africans in the entire Americas. Um, later estimates around the middle of the 19th century placed at 80,000 slaves in the city. So it's 80,000 slaves, 15,000 members of the royal court, no police force when the when the king gets there. So they sets up the police force and creates all the institutions. So in 1815, Napoleon is feared, finally defeated. The king goes back to Portugal. Um, he's already declared Brazil an equal kingdom. He said that Portugal is no longer an empire, it's a united kingdom. The kingdom of Brazil, the kingdom of Portugal, and the kingdom of the Algraves. The Portuguese court does not like this idea at all. They want to have, Portu they want to have Brazil subordinated again. So the king's son says, I'm the king of Brazil. I'm independent unless dad comes back. So dad's over in Portugal. I'm independent, though. So the Portuguese Cortes ended up striving to resubordinate Brazil. They sent troops. Um, and over the next two years, until 1823, Portugal strugg struggled to hold on to its colony. What you have to realize is the colony and the, 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 the Portugal were already knitted together. So that meant the soldiers were fighting against members of their own platoons. 
Members of the ships would often mutiny and declare for one side or the other. So a ship that was in the Brazilian Navy, the Portuguese sailors would get together, overthrow the Portuguese, overthrow the Brazilian commander, and the ship would switch sides. So the, the, literally you'd have militias with Portuguese loyalty and Brazilian loyalty fighting in Brazilian cities over whether they were going to be independent or not. This went on for two years. So the cities are being torn apart by this kind of conflict. Finally, Brazil becomes uh, independent. Um, and in this internal civil war, slaves, sailors, and freedmen took both sides. This is the beginning of the gangs, arguably. The resulting historical period from 1822 to 1889 is the Brazilian empire. They have a king, they have their own king, a European king ruling over a tropical empire in the Americas and their independence. And they, and they become very profitable and very successful. One of the things that's really interesting, I think, about Capoeira history is at this time, so it's not a poor backwater city. It's actually the, the capital of one of the most powerful, rich, sugarcane growing regions in the tropics with a European king riding on this dangerous wild west city with 80,000 slaves who have poor supervision, who are forming their own organizations. Some of them have fought for independence. Some of them have fought to stay with Portugal. And when it's all over, that the control is very dicey of the, of the king over this whole thing. So what happens is when he recruits police officers, some of them come from the gangs. So gang members are become part of this. In fact, I think it, the migration of the Portuguese court changed the level of disorder that was considered tolerable. Suddenly they have police and they're, and they're arresting people for, this is a great picture, I think, because this woman is actually um, of North African descent and she has slave porters for herself as well. Just showing the complexity of this relationship. The migration of the Portuguese court changed what was acceptable. So one of the first issues they sought to resolve was Capoeira. As historian Thomas Holloway writes, Capoeira was one of the offenses against the public order that in themselves injured no person or property, but which those who set the rules and established the police found it unacceptable. By 1817, the penalty for Capoeira was 300 lashes and three months of forced labor for slaves. If you were, the, if you were a freed man caught for Capoeira, you didn't get the lashes but you still got the three months of hard labor. So slaves got a worse penalty for the same crime. Um, even those Brazilian scholars who at the time were fascinated by Brazilian folklore hated capoeiras. Because they were, I mean, if you think about it, I'm sort of taking this, this is like the Crips and the Bloods of this time period in Brazil. So although we now celebrate it as Brazilian folklore, even the folklorists of the day hated it. They, I mean, one guy called it um, the canker, you know, like a mouth sore of the empire. So one significant obstacle to eradication, though, in the police force was that just as the demand for order had increased when the throne came over, so had the forces of disorder begun to infiltrate the institutions and classes that they were allegedly to bring to order. So it's not clear when Capoeiras entered the police force or when police took up Capoeira, but by the end of the 19th century, even the police chief, who is most notorious for oppressing Capoeira, was himself a renowned practitioner. And you actually had cases where representatives in the Congress would challenge each other to Capoeira battles to settle legislative disputes for insulting each other. And so he'd say, meet me outside, I'm going to kick your ass. You know, we're going to do Capoeira now. Even though they were passing laws against the practice. So what, it was illegal for the slaves, but they themselves would take it up. The young men who were in the elite would hang out with these guys because this is where the nightlife was. They would often take up the practices. There were notorious cases where the, literally like the Duke's son would be arrested and then there would be a whole thing where the police chief was trying to deport him. His father was trying to intercede with the king not to have his son deported, all because this was where the nightlife was. These, these guys were dominating nightlife. All right, so Capoeiras became bodyguards and companions to the young male elite of the Brazilian empire who themselves started to learn Capoeira. Leaders in the militia, some of them prominent Capoeiristas, leaders in the police force, 22 minutes. Um, blurred the lines between what was unacceptable and what was acceptable. You could argue that it was unacceptable depending upon who you were, not what you were doing. One Capoeira, for example, named Juca Hayes, the son of the Count of Matazinos, who was the owner of a very influential Republican newspaper, almost provoked a constitutional crisis for the entire country because he was involved in a number of brawls, these sorts of wild brawls where people fought with knives and razor blades and bricks and clubs in the city and oftentimes fought off the police. And they tried to deport him, but they almost brought down the government because of this. It was so scandalous that he was going to be deported. My point is that in spite of persecution, the imperial elite was being infiltrated in a variety of ways by this distinctly colonial form of violence and bodily practice. 
Portuguese were becoming capoeiraized, and the Portuguese court was becoming capoeiraized. Just as, even though they were trying to eradicate the gangs, the gangs were actually infiltrating and persuading their sons to take up the practice, their sons to take bodyguards from these gangs. So you can see the kind of love-hate relationship that was really, I think it's amazing. Now, Capoeira clearly had African roots, and I would never deny that. I've sometimes been accused, because I bring this up, of saying Capoeira clearly got African roots. But already in the 19th century, you've got a really mixed population doing it. There's a lot of people getting involved in it. They, you could argue they're being, the, the Europeans were becoming Africanized, or they're becoming urbanized in this distinctive way. They were becoming persuaded by this long before the 20th century. But even, even prison became a problem because in prison, the same problem we have now with gangs was happening there as well. The capoeiras were imprisoned. They were often imprisoned with political dissidents. The political dissidents would teach the capoeira guys how to organize. They would teach them political ideology. And the, the capoeira guys would teach the political dissidents how to fight. So you'd have prison islands. And what would come out of the prison islands would be harder, smarter, better organized gangs. As the imperial century wore on, this process ended up leading the forms of disorder to become increasingly organized. They formed gangs that they called Maltas, after the island of Malta. Um, they, be, they were territorial. They were organized by neighborhood. And they fought running battles. Um, by the 1870s, the clandestine and shifting configuration of gangs, this just shows some of these guys. This, this article is actually, though, from 1907. So it's already a bit of a nostalgic reworking of what was happening. I mean, you would never have gotten pictures that looked this nice of guys doing this in 1875 when it was a crisis. So we've got these pictures. And they, what you can really see in these are some of the movements that even today are considered the most traditional capoeira movements, the cabezada, the headbutts, the trips, um, the way that they're fighting. These are sort of archetypal capoeira techniques. Um, the, and that they're being used in, in brawling in a kind of completely unregulated fighting form, although it's still ritualized. I mean, there were still kind of things you didn't do, um, although not a lot. I mean, when they fight with razor blades, you kind of pretty much have taken the gloves off, I think. It's, uh, they split the city. There were two primary groups, the Guayamus and the Nagoas. One controlled more inner city around the port. One controlled more of the urban periphery with the new immigrants. There, there are some racial associations in the photo. It's hard to tell from this drawing. They could, you could also tell them apart by how they wore the brim of their caps. This was like, just like today we have gang signals you know, that you can recognize. These guys, where, how they wore their cap and what color um, the band was on the hat would tell you which mem what gang they were members of. And these two gangs actually emerged. There were many more gangs, but they sort of emerged out of the struggle for dominance as you either had to merge and become larger or you were going to get eradicated by the stronger gangs. So for a while, there were like six or seven major gangs, but they sort of devoured each other through the course of the warfare over 20 years. What is perhaps most striking about the Malta is how well they were organized with complex internal hierarchies, clear pathways for recruitment and advancement. You had ranks. Fixed locations for physical training. You knew where the training sessions were if you wanted to be recruited. Um, and public symbols of affiliation that people wore freely in public. Um, and there was a whole discussion in the police, why aren't we arresting these people? And you could be arrested for any indication that you were a member of the gang. So if you carried an instrument, if you wore the hat, you could be picked up for this. Um, let's sort of wrap up this section. Um, I will just point out, OK. The most interesting connection between the forces of disorder and the imperial order of this strange tropical capital was the role of the Maltas in electoral politics and eventually civil war. Capoeiras were recruited to work as what are called capangas. These are people who help to get out the vote or stop the other guy's votes from getting in. So capangas are strong men. It's like the Chicago politics model. You send people to intimidate folks at the polling stations you know are going to vote for your enemy, and you send people to protect your voters. Uh, only about 2% of the Brazilian population could legally vote, so it didn't take a lot of votes to swing an election one way or the other. And so the gangs were basically brought in to, f to fight for the liberals and the conservatives, the two primary political parties. Um, the conservatives were in favor of the crown, and the liberals were in favor of the new emerging, um, uh, I would call them the capitalists, the bourgeoisie in the urban areas. And the conservatives also had the rural countryside. But the conservatives had better relationships with the gangs. Um, so the conservatives won a lot of the elections until the republic finally um, was declared. In the 1870s, liberal politicians accused the conservative rivals of securing their power through the use of government bayonets and the razors of Capoeira gangs. As um, the historian of Sanson writes about these guys, there could be no doubt the Maltas contributed to exacerbate political violence and to render elections farcical. So the gangs were controlling the democratic process 
um, in the city, even though they couldn't vote legally because they were legally either slaves, ex-slaves, they weren't part of that 2%. So democracy was, I would argue democracy was being controlled from below in this case, although in alliance with the elites because the gangs were controlling elections. Um, so why, why the Princess Isabella song, to wrap this up and go on to talk about the brain. The political association, especially the tight link with conservative politicians, helps us to understand Princess Isabel. Liberals, unhappy with the empire, which admittedly was being headed by an exhausted ruler who had no acceptable heir because the Portuguese would never transfer the crown to a woman. So even though Princess Isabella was the oldest, she could never become queen. They didn't have like, they weren't like the English. Um, they did very poorly building relationships with the black population of Rio. They refused to deal closely with the Maltas and especially because the Maltas represented the workers who they were trying to squeeze more out of because they were the urban capitalists. So they had natural class rivalry with the gangs because the gangs were representing the porters who wanted more money and things like that. So after abolition in 1888, the conservatives cemented a strong relationship with the form after that they freed the slaves. They even encouraged, the conservatives encouraged the new formation of the, what they called the Black Guard, composed mostly of freedmen loyal to the monarchy, many of them veterans who had come to the city and were unemployed or they were treated very badly by those urban elites who were part of the Republicans. So basically you had veterans, former slaves, and gang members fighting on behalf of the crown. They ended up losing. In 1889, they lost. And when they lost, the police chief took off after them. The defeat of the monarchists led to severe backlash against the Maltas by the incoming Republican police chief, even though he himself knew Capueta. He attacked the Capueta gangs. The repression ultimately basically destroyed the gangs. It would lead to the, the, the complete political evisceration of Capueta until the 1930s, when it had been so beaten down that the dictator could reintroduce it as a kind of symbol of national identity. You can only, you can only co-opt disorder into your state once you've thoroughly made sure the disorder's not dangerous anymore. So, so why do, what do I take from this whole case? Well, the first is the entire imperial period in Brazil, which was enormously successful and profitable, was supported by a variety of forms of disorder and by these unpredictable alliances, some between the Capuetas and the rivals for power at the top. So the bottom and the top often aligned together. The empire was a dynamic system that took shape from a variety of forces. The collapse of one side actually usually heralded much, uh, heralded much greater upheaval, because once there was collapse, the one side that was now in control tried to eradicate the other side before it could reestablish itself. So usually you didn't have revolt until one side got control. You only had stability when you had the rival gangs basically at equal power or the rival political parties. Now to the present and the way that this history gets evoked. I had this on my own computer and I had this. This is now, a, this is actually a video, an old video of Capoeira. Uh, this is from Mestre Bimba's school, the man who created Capoeira Hegenal, which would become the national, you could argue the national sport under the dictator sort of the 1930s. This is from his own school. Now Mestre Bimba himself was again a complex figure. He was very much a strong proponent of black culture. His wife was in the Candomblé. Um, he knew about traditional medicines. He was actually, you could argue he was thoroughly steep in the sort of African side of Brazilian life. And yet he was, in, in, he had formed this alliance with the dictatorship, in part because he was useful to them and because for his purposes, it was a chance to get his school established and legalized. His students would become student, mostly from students, especially once it was established, from medical schools. They were the sons of the elite. And they would help him to sort of spread Capoeira. So again, this alliance between the elites and very powerful Afro-Brazilian actors. In this case, a very knowledgeable this is um, Mestre Bimba's uh, wife. This is another group. This is more the traditionalist style. Now, for those of you guys who do Capoeira, you'll notice how similar in this stage the two look. Bimba's school and these guys actually play quite similarly in some ways. The, arguably, the split we have today where they're so different was not established in the 1940s and 1950s when these films were made. So in the present, in the way this history of the disorderly gets recalled, uh, it tends to be in song, in books, seminars, workshops, iconography, and the symbols people wear on their t-shirts, in the names of groups. I've, I've written about it at length, but the short version, I would argue, is that people like to sing about this time because it makes Capueta sinister. It makes what could be considered a dance suddenly fraught with all kinds of other implications. I, a great example is I was playing once in, in the Academy of Mestre Curio, this fellow in, in, in Salvador, 
And he took his hand at one point when he was doing a move, and he went like this to the other guy's neck, right? Just drew his hand across the neck. Now, the only way you know what that meant, it just it looks like a flourish. This is allegedly the way that you would hold a straight razor when you fought. You flicked it open, you slashed with it, and you flicked it closed. And so when, when he did this, it was actually alluding to this time period when the gangs were there. And so the guy who he did it to sort of knew it, and he reeled back like he'd been cut. And he was sort of indicating, you know, if you had had a straight razor, I, you know, I could have had my throat cut. So it was a, oh, you'd only understand it because you sing about this time and you say, this is what we're doing. Um, a ritual combat only makes sense if you keep reminding yourself of real combat, and if you're capable of feeling viscerally what's implied in that action. When you can feel that, and when you can understand what that is, it's a lot scarier, and you realize that what you're doing is very serious. This is what Capoeira practitioners and teachers will tell you. This is just the game, but be careful. It doesn't have to be a game. And I've, I've seen, in, especially in Salvador and Rio, you know, Capoeira today in the United States, it, it can be fairly tame by comparison. Um, and I'm hoping you guys keep it tame. I'm not, I'm not encouraging any razors, okay? Just, just leave them in your bags. Yeah, it's like a crack in your knuckles back there. Yeah. Uh, a fascination with disorder constantly reemerges in Capoeira in song, mythology, and heroic self-fashioning. People sing about the Maltas, about slave revolts, about upheaval. I've got another video that's gonna need to go. This is, um, let's see, I'll show you this. I was showing this to um, Laurie Frederick beforehand, and, Every, this is a performance that was staged for this video, but every one of these outfits references one of the historical things I'm talking about. These, this guy, for example, right now who's coming up is dressed like the classic um, Brazilian malandro, a kind of, uh, kind of um, bad guy. Uh, um, uh, he's a, I should, um, how can I put this? He's a, it was a guy who lived on his wits, oftentimes with money from wealthy women who liked his talents oftentimes by having a little traffic on the side and goods that weren't entirely legal, sometimes by being an enforcer for a, a, a house of, um, you know, a bookies agent or something like that. So he's dressed like that. The other guys, some of them are dressed like dock workers, like the sailors who would have also done this art. And then some of the guys are dressed like the rural workers who also led to this. So in this performance, which is very slow and stylized and controlled, you actually see these different characters that I'm talking about being acted out. Um, so the irony is the contemporary understanding, I think, of this story. If you just see it as resistance to slavery, you miss all of this rich history. You miss that there's actually all these different groups going on. Now, I'm especially struck by the popularity of just talking about the Discapuita history and the violence. Um, not just because the contemporaries saw it as a bad thing, all those people back in the 19th century, but because today we see a weird split. People celebrating violence in the dance, celebrating history of gang violence alongside real gang violence in Brazil. So it was brought home to me especially when I was there in 1994 and I went down to Rio for a conference where everybody was talking about this history at the conference. And on the news at night we would watch as the police tried to raid the favelas, the hillside slums, to try to knock out the drug gangs. And at one point I remember very clearly seeing footage of an attack helicopter hovering over one of the favelas, shooting into the favela, and somebody had an, a rocket-propelled grenade launcher in the favela, was shooting, looked look like, yeah, Baghdad, exactly. And then here we are celebrating <laughs> gang violence. So it was a weird kind of split where we celebrate one kind of gang violence, and at the same time, the other is considered to be the social plague that we have to get rid of. So let's talk about the brain. Let's wrap this up and talk about the brain. For those of you who know my work, you know I'm a neuroanthropologist or who've heard of me or even just listened to the introduction. How does, this, how does history get into the brain then from this? Um, I've been working on the rise of a number of, different uh, a number of different issues in human neural development. Very interested in the way that cultural diversity leads to neural diversity. So the way in which cultural variation, different forms of training affect the way our brains develop, our sensitivity. So even basic things like pain tolerance can be very much conditioned differently depending upon what you grew up in. Expected. We know that from medical studies, not just from, um, I mean, it's not just something people say. We know that people will rate pain differently depending upon the ethnic group they come from, their, their backgrounds and things like that. Um, but I'm especially interested in skill acquisition because I think skill acquisition is one of the best models of the way that we shape our own nervous systems. Um, I'm especially focused on how physiological, the physiological consequences of training help us to better understand culturally induced biological variation, including uh, a weird one, which I, I'll sort of bring up, but I won't talk about very much. I'm very interested in the, the peculiar, fragile modern body, what I call Homo sapiens anthropocene. This weird way that we've made ourselves, unlike any other humans that have lived before us in evolution, 
incapable of all kinds of things that our ancestors were capable of. So if you look at our bodies, our bones are weaker, our, you know, we're, we're different, even than people were 200 years ago. Um, to find skeletons like the skeletons of medieval workers, you have to get professional athletes. Those are the only ones who have it. So uh, that's all I'll say about that, but I can come back to that if you're interested. So my version of neuroanthropology, and it's not the only one, has been heavily influenced by people like um, Tim Ingold, who talks about the way that culture isn't just ideas in your head. Culture is the way your body has grown. That over time, it, it, it's enfolded into your sensitivities and your reflexes. And just to give you a quick example, that I'm going to draw one from Capueta. Um, there's a range of ways. One of the ones that got me interested in this um, let's get that, was this move, uh, bananata na cabeza. Now, in the traditional form of Capueta, you put your head on the ground a lot. You, you do what we call, bananata just means um, banana tree, but it's head, it basically is handstand. So it's handstand on your head, which doesn't really make much sense, but it's handstand on your head, bananata na cabeza. What I'm interested in is, um, in the bananata na cabeza, from the Capueta point of view, it's a dynamic movement. It's not a static position like you do in yoga. You move around in it, you jump into it. Um, when we're trained to do bananata cabeza, um, it can be pretty rough. Let me sort of give it a year ago. Capoeira used to call this, um, you know, while yoga and gymnastics involve various types of headstands, in Capoeira training, practitioners are asked to jump into headstands, leap over other players or a chair. So we put a chair out and jump over it into a headstand. So you come down on your hands onto your head. Um, we place the head on the ground, then pivot around it. Um, moves like the bien or the, you know, which is a, means the top, where you spin on your head, or the escovin, the push broom, where you slide on your head. I could never do the piano very well at all. I always fell over as soon as I started. But I could do the escovin like miles. For some reason, not get enough sweat on your head, it's like lubricant. You just slide across the floor. Um, so, you know, this kind of move. Now, when I first saw it, I, I, I sort of saw it through the eyes of my mother. And the first thing I said was, oh my God, you're going to break your neck. You know, like that was what I assumed. Like, your neck is fragile. And if you put your head on the ground, you're going to break your neck. And other Capoeira practitioners who were not from the traditional school said the same thing. Said, don't put your head down. It's dangerous. You'll hurt yourself. And yet I would see people do amazing things. During field work in Salvador from 1993 to 95, especially, I trained under a guy named Valmir Damaseno. Um, he's a, he's a contra master, Valmir. People might know him as Mr. Valmir now. And he teaches with the group, uh, the FICA, Foundation International de Capoeira Angola, who has an office or a group in DC. Valmir was amazing. He constantly moved in ways that seemed beyond the envelope of what was humanly possible. But in particular, he did headstands that blew my mind. And one, I remember one very clearly where he was doing a headstand where the weight was actually resting sort of just above his ear. His head was sort of flopped over on one shoulder. And he was vertical and he picked his arms up. And he sort of stood on, imagine me upside down like this with the weight here. And I couldn't imagine how his spine just didn't pop out the back of his body. You know, it just looked like this kind of thing that would break your neck. When students, when students are first asked to train in this, you're given minimal instruction, you're just told to do it. You know, vamos, vamos en border, we're gonna do it, let's go. And so you do it and, and you, you, new people are always in the back of the room and you start hearing the thunk, you know, <laughs> the, the head on the ground. And nobody even pays attention when you first do it unless you really hear a loud thunk. And then you only turn around to laugh because you know it's part of the training. And the first time you do it, it hurts and your head feels sort of soft the next day and you think, oh my God, I broke my skull. And then you go to the thing and people say, no, it's normal. And then chunks of skin come off with little follicle holes and no, no, it's normal, you need calluses. Uh, and you keep doing it in about two weeks, you're fine. And then you find out that not only can you do a headstand like that, but in fact, suddenly this whole world of movement is opened up to you that you didn't know existed, all because your head can be used as a fifth limb. Now that to me is a really, in the, in the book I wrote on Capoeira in 2005, I said, if you look at this from the outside, it doesn't make sense. And that, from the outside, it looks like a symbol. And I'm only about three or four minutes from finishing, so don't worry. Um, if it, you know, it looks like a symbol of inversion, but when you do it, it's all about learning your body can do things that never, you never thought they could do. And I think th this isn't just true about this technique. I think in a lot of Capoeira techniques, in a lot of sports and yoga, it's about discovering your body is capable of things that it's never capable of otherwise. And what's interesting, though, about the Capoeira movement is in this case, this is a daily practice that makes sense if you know the people who created the art. If you know the people who created the art, they carried things on their heads. If you look at any pictures of porters and stevedores from that era of the 19th century I'm talking about, they carried huge weights on their heads. Um, there's stories, for example, of Mr. Bimba carrying sacks of concrete on his head out of boats. So not only was he carrying it out of, think about it, you're not just carrying it on your head, you're carrying it on a gangplank, which means you're swaying 
under sacks of concrete. So your neck is learning to do all the adaptations you're going to need to do to hold your own body upside down. There's pictures of slaves and um, those porters carrying a piano, for example, on their heads. A team of slaves, the, the piano's on top, and they're all carrying it on their heads. Now, I think in that, when you start to see it that way, you realize that when people get taught, when desk jockeys, white collar workers, university students get taught to put their head on the ground, they are recovering a bodily practice that historically made sense that no longer really makes sense. They become a living artifact of a way of life that doesn't exist anymore, or only exists in very small pockets, or not in Brazil it exists. Now there's forklifts to empty boats, and there's, so people don't learn this about their own body, their body has this fifth limb. In other words, although the Beninata Bene Cabeza and related Capoeira movements are spectacular, they make use of possibilities within human anatomy that manifest in certain environments. If you're raised in an area where they do this, you're going to discover this about your neck. It's actually not easily breakable. Your wrist is more is more fragile than your neck. Um, you may not re recognize it, but it, you know. Bringing, bearing weight atop the head, putting the body's weight on top of the head, are potentials inherent in the human body, but you only realize them through slowly being introduced to it. So one of the reasons I study skill up is, I mean, I got a few more photos. Actually, I should have showed this. Um, that's, the guy with the dreads in front is actually, um, is actually Cobra, who used to run the group down in DC, uh, Master Cobra. And then, I have a video, it must be clogged. It's checking for a solution to the problem. All right, I have a problem. Um, one of the reasons I study skill acquisition, sensory learning, and movement training as forms of enculturation is that we have some of the best data in the brain sciences on changes in brain structure from these sorts of activities, from physical activities and from skills. So we have data on juggling, we have data on um, learning musical instruments that show that the brain is actually changed by what you learn. I would argue that there's, there's at least prima facie evidence that the brain is being changed by what you're learning and physical skills are one of the best places to look for it because it shows up more. We can't tell the difference between a Chinese speaker and an English speaker from their brain. But we can tell the difference between a person who juggles from a person who doesn't juggle. You know, ironically, it's easier to tell that because if you speak Chinese or English, you use the same parts to do both. Whereas if you do juggling, it requires a certain wiring up of the brain that you have to build over time. Um, and in particular, with the, head, with the head thing, I think is really interesting is skill acquisition also requires quieting systems that get in the way. For example, reflexes to protect yourself that are counterproductive. So first time you stand on your head, one of the things people will do is they'll tuck their head under to protect themselves like this. And what that does, of course, is it rolls you onto your back. So you have to learn not to protect yourself. You have to learn when you jump over that chair, put your hands down, that the way that you come down is actually to reach your head and neck for the floor. So when they touch down, you have some space to give. So you literally have to sort of push your head towards the ground to have the space to be able to take the pressure off it. It's completely counterintuitive. There's no way I could tell you to do it. I would just have to let you smack your head into the ground a few times until you figured it out. That's sort of what I have to do um, as part of the learning. So to wrap up, this link then between history and practice, between a way of life, a physical way of life that existed in the 19th century and today, I think is a really important way to understand the gap, why it's so hard to learn capital, the gap between our everyday capacities and what we're asking it to do. It helps us to understand. I wanted to have. It helps us to understand why, for example, that when these guys in the 19th century did it, they actually called capoeira variation, vagrancy. To them, it wasn't physical. It wasn't physical fitness. It wasn't demanding compared to their job. It was actually play, because a, to a body that did what theirs did, this was play. This was relaxation. To us. It's the most vigorous thing we do. And it shows the gap in a sense. I think it, it actually emphasizes the value for understanding that they were not like us. That people from different historical periods had very different capacities. People from other cultures have quite different physical capacities. And we see that. We see the way Capoeira has moved from a game played by Maltas to a physical activity done today by people who have, it's the most extreme thing they do. So to wrap up, in conclusion, I think Practical communities, communities of practice, people who have training techniques or disciplines, make distinctive sensory motor demands on themselves. And in the process, this leads to deep change in the way that they function. They learn, uh, we were talking about rugby over on the side earlier. I think rugby players have to learn how to gather information out of very visually confusing environments. And the only way you do that is by becoming very good. We know 
um, baseball players and, and cricket batsmen do it as well. You have to learn how to pull the information out of the pitcher's motion to know where the ball is going. And the only way you do that is by changing your nervous system. It, it should be physiologically impossible to do what some of these athletes do. And it is until you build a body that can do it and the nervous system can do it. And the Ben and Cabeza, I'm sorry, that should be Na Cabeza. For those of you taking notes at the back because you want to learn this, go home, dive over the chair. Um, it's a historical rec relic that becomes taken into our nervous system and you, in a sense, become a living reenactment of a way of life that may not exist anymore. I think this example of deep uh, neurophysiological change highlights the depth of culture and the need to get beyond, I'm calling it to get into those subcortical regions. The, what I'm making is a distinction between cortical, what might be conscious or explicit, and these subcortical things, these forms of training you may not even know you have. So the things that make you stressed, the things that, you know, the fear of breaking your neck may not even be something you're consciously aware of, but physically you're aware of it. So I think that's where I'm going to wrap up. Um, I think I'm pretty, pretty good on that time. I've got lots more I could say, but Lori has told me you guys like to ask questions and talk. So I kind of want to hear from you and not do all the talk. Thanks, guys. So does anyone want to try jumping over a chair into a headstand before we get there? That was my first suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> They're all lining up back there. No, yeah. <laughs> um, do we have some questions? Or for comments or anything? For Greg Downey. Or we can have a banana, what is it, on your? Banana cabeza. Yeah. Anybody would like to try that? Show us. Questions? Um. I, I got a bit confused. Could you just go over again when it went from being a a violent, uh, you know, engagement to being more of a dance-like activity? Well, we, uh, what I'm suggesting, I think, is that this this game probably existed in some forms even back then, but it wasn't. And in fact, there's some evidence, especially in Salvador, that even carrying the instrument that you'll see was considered grounds for being arrested. So the game was being played in the gangs. Now, what's happened is all the other activity has been stripped away. The gangs are gone the gang battles are gone, but that game is carried on. So the name has sort of been condensed down to this. The, the, if you want to know, it was le wasn't legalized until, say, the 1930s is the first time. And literally, when I went there in the 90s, police still used the word capoeira to mean somebody who was a, kind of a, should be looked after, looked at. So they'd say, oh, don't go down to this part of the town. It's full of, you know, it's full of vagios, it's full of vagrants and capoeiras. And they would still be using that term as a sort of derogatory term. But really the change started to happen in the 1920s and 1930s when the first academies were legalized, oftentimes only for the elites. So you had, you had in some periods you actually had people practicing it legally in a school and being arrested for it in the street. You get a weird split where you've got both happening. And of course the people who were practicing it in the schools were paying medical students. And the people getting arrested for it in the streets were poor, darker skinned, working class guys doing it in front of churches on feast days. So up until, really up until the 70s and 80s, it was still considered shady. I'd say that one thing that the rise of Capoeira, Angola has done for all of Capoeira is it's sort of helped to make the argument that it's folklore strong and not just fighting. So even though people don't all practice Capoeira and Angola, some of them practice modern styles, a lot of them, you could say, have benefited from that um, re revival of the cultural side. But especially once the, once the medical students started flooding in, it was hard to keep it illegal because you don't arrest them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are there any records of the uh, Portuguese courts bringing, it, uh, bringing the capoeira back to Portugal? Well, that's a good question. You know, there aren't, but, but there's a really interesting thing. I, I was sort of looking at this. Um, you ever heard of the musical style fado in yeah. Portugal, the, the singing style? Fadista, if you say fadista it, to a person who's sort of an older Portuguese person, they will say, oh, and they think, they think of a, a gangster with a razor blade. So I'm not sure, but one of the arguments is that actually some of this was coming back across the, the Atlantic in the form of these guys who were hanging out, because fado was a sort of nightclub singing style of the lower class, especially the docks. So I think in the ports, you probably had it in the ports and the sailors, especially the knife fighting styles. In fact, even the guys on the Brazilian side of things would say, you know, all the capoeiras are rats, but man, be careful of the fadistas with the razor blades. Because those guys are, you know, probably because they're not obvious that they're carrying a weapon, whereas the ex-slave is obvious to them. Whereas the Portuguese guy who's carrying the razor blade isn't so obvious. So, so there's, not, there's some evidence that did come up across. Some people argue Savate, the French fighting style, has actually been influenced by Capoeira. Um, so French, France has a kickboxing style, 
Um, and that was associated with sailors as well. So there's a real sense in which we may be seeing the rise of a pan-Atlantic fighting complex linked to sailors and ports and both African and you know, Iberian French culture. So does that help at all? All right, in the back, a couple, couple questions. First in the front, then. Yeah. Um, so, uh, if I'm, am I, I'm trying to figure out if, if I'm understanding your argument correctly, um, and I, I, I'm going to phrase it as a question. Could you, could you talk for a minute about the implications of, of um, this understanding of how, how, how culture and the brain relate uh, for people that want to use neurophysiology as a causal explanation for cultural, beha cultural behavior? <laughs> I would say that I, I'm, I kinda, for those of you who know brain sciences, I kind of come out of a development, a development systems theory uh, where we really look at the relationship. How in one period, what's culture and what's body may be obvious, but as you run them, it stops being, in the next period, it's no longer obvious which was which because each stage changes both. So, for example, if you're teaching a child to read, at first it looks like they've got a brain and there's reading and you're teaching them the reading. But in the second stage, the brain has already changed now and it's starting to have visual biases, whether it goes left to right or right to left. And so I would say that my approach suggests that two things. First of all, that you can't draw an easy line between culture and biology because as soon as you get a developmental system, they, that breaks down. But second of all, probably a lot of stuff that looks really radically different on the surface, like Chinese and English, may actually be neurologically quite similar underneath if you sort of look at the way it's working. So one of the things that I find that sports are so interesting is, you know, we think of sports as being the same category, but in fact they're making very different demands on the brain and body, radically different demands. And so one of the things about this cool about sports is to see how far you can push a system to go, for example, to high speed intercept skills like hitting a tennis ball versus weight, you know, how much can you drive it with weights and see really creating different human animals out of that. So I think, does that answer your question to some degree? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, 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 guess, I guess what I found, what the interesting implication for me was that you seem to be pushing against the reification of the brain, which seems like a really problematic part to me of these kind of causal explanations that come out of the neural humanities. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think, um, I think the, biggest, the, the biggest one I can point to, that if you really want to mess up somebody in the sort of neural humanities who thinks the brain causes humanities is, point out the difference between literacy and illiteracy. Because this is a categorical transformation, not just in the brain, but in how culture operates. Because once you have literacy, you've got a completely different form of channel of communication and transformation of what, how people use their memory. Illiteracy, totally different demands on the brain, totally different demands. So I think those are a great one. And we know that literacy reliably uses the same parts of the brain, even in radically different languages. So reading Chinese, reading English, reading Italian. <coughs> it's very, so here's a case where I mean, you can tell from a brain scan whether a person is literate or not. A simple test, show them letters, bang, you can tell instantly whether they're literate or not. So I would say that's a clear case where you can see that. that, that yeah. In the back, you had a question. I think my question is kind of related to that. Yeah. Um, well, I'm interested in what kinds of studies were done on the brain with these different skill acquisition tests and like with different kinds of dances or different kinds of movement. Because I'm thinking about dance versus martial arts and learning choreography versus learning something that requires strategy or something. And I'm wondering, when you say there's subcortical changes that are happening, I'm wondering if the argument is that you're learning cultural knowledge based only on the movement, or if you also have to be learning about the culture or about the strategy or about whatever context goes along with it yeah. at the same time. And if there have been studies that have been done that kind of look at, you know, just learning choreography or just learning steps, just learning movement versus learning, you know, the whole context. You know, there's, the hard part is there's actually a lot of little studies that are sort of different parts of this that don't really add up to the whole. I mean, one of the things we, one of the reasons I'm pushing neuroanthropology is because I really want to push the study of human diversity in brain sciences to get away from the idea the brain is uniform. And the only way we're going to do it is by really choosing some interesting test cases where people have developed really distinctive neural capacities. So one study that does spring to mind immediately, there's a woman named Calvo Marino, I know this, um, who's looked at ballet and capoeira dancers. And what she finds is that the mirror system, the, this premotor system which tends to respond to movement, 
if you're training capoeira, you'll, your premotor system will become very active when you see a capoeira technique, won't become so active when you see a ballet technique. So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem to boot up your own movement areas like the ballet does, even when it's the same dynamic. So even like, um, you know, an armada, which is kind of a spinning back kick, if you, you do the, you know, I can't remember what the, I think it might be a jeté or something in, the, in ballet, the same dynamic, they're kind of spinning back kick. Um, you won't get a rise off of the opposite practitioners. They won't sort of note it. The, the, they won't pick up that mechanical thing in their premotor areas. Now there's been some interesting studies around skills, but I, I honestly think this is one of the areas where we really need to push it. And one of the problems is, of course, that most functional magnetic resonance image, most of these studies have to be done in a giant magnet. Lying on your back, not acting, imagining stuff, or watching video, or listening to something. It's very hard to study these kinds of questions. Very hard to even invent a test that will test it. And so I think, I, mean, we, I was talking about this, we're trying to come up with ways that we can try to study you know, rugby players on the field when they're getting hit. Because if you bring them into a lab and you show them a video of rugby, that is not what they're doing. You know, and you can ask them questions about, I mean, part of what they're doing is they're stressing themselves out, they're getting exhausted. So I think one of the reasons ways, I mean, we have a, I was actually at a conference, we have a guy named Marco Iacoboni who, who did um, some of the best stuff on mirror neurons. He was there and he said, we've got a bias in our brain science to study the stuff we can get at. And what we can get at is a centimeter and a half deep in the brain. That's, that's what we study. So he says, we know all kinds of stuff about this, and we don't know what's going on in here. Um, because that's what our instruments are really good at getting at. So Marco was actually saying, he's a neuroscientist, he was saying, we've got to get at these internal structures. And we know they're doing lots of stuff, and they're getting repurposed. And like the, you know, the brainstem stuff, the midbrain stuff, the amygdala, all this, the form memories that, that have emotional reactions. Um, we know what's happening with the association layer on the outside of the brain. We don't know what's happening inside so well. So even the neuroscientists are saying, we've got to get this. And the, arguably, the second wave of cognitive science is moving towards studies of connection rather than location. Yeah. And I think that's going to be really exciting for this kind of work. So I, I, look, I love cognitive science stuff. I just want to get them to study. Like, every time I'm in a cognitive science meeting, I'm always like, oh, you think that's weird. Let me tell you about these people you got to study. You know, all the clinics that's so strange. Like, there was some guy talking about reading. Um, and I said, you know, you've got to study blind people in Braille more. This is, you know, how are they responding to this? Um, and I work with some blind guys who echolocate. They click and they hear space. And there's been some preliminary studies done of them. And it's amazing. They end up using visual systems to, to interpret this echo information. It's just showing how, you know, it's not an innate structure. Even, even what we call V1, which is the primary visual processing, the first part of the brain to get the visual information can be taken and done, you can do something else with it. As long as vision isn't in there, occupying the space, keeping it out, you know, and controlling it, so. Great question. A couple more questions and then we'll. Let the guys. See it in action. I have one question about disorder. Yeah. And consciousness of disorderliness in contemporary capoeira practice. Is there a connection? I mean, it, you know, in, in addition to just kind of how your body is learning to do things that I wouldn't ordinarily, ordinarily do. Does disorder come into the practice of how the body <coughs> so much. I mean, I do think there's a, maybe you guys could probably say as much as I, I mean, I think there's a sense in which Kepwita practitioners still talk about that link to the tough guys and, and you know, to street life and to, you know. But, but I think what's interesting in some ways is that Kepwita has been, I mean, I don't think it's a bad thing entirely. It's been transformed by the importation of, of physical education techniques. It's, it's transformed it in some ways. I mean, one thing I was wondering is, to me, those old videos don't look very good. Like, the guys aren't really that intense. I mean, compared to some of the guys we have today, you know, the women who have to do it today, I mean, they're animals today. I and mean, these folks, it's like the difference between watching pre-professional sport and professional sport. And the professional athletes are just doing stuff when you're like. So one thing that's really, the orderliness of the current transmission has actually built a space where arguably more than ever is being done. You know, where instead of just a guy putting his head down on the ground and doing a headstand, now they're importing things from break dancing and root experimenting and techniques are being done now that probably you would have never seen 30 years ago. They just don't exist. So I think it's actually, it, disorder has a symbolic importance, but it's actually quite orderly right now. Yeah. I think that I, I'm in the two schools of how put Angola versus Hedge now, now and how they have different philosophies on it. Angola sticks to the folklorish traditional style. And Hajin Al is coming more like other martial arts, where it's being very rigidized and standardized, and they're starting to have competitions, and things must be done this way, and things must be done that way. 
Whereas before, it was just people getting in a circle and kicking each other. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, and also, I mean, even a simple thing, like some of the schools, for example, the basic step, which is the Zinga, the sort of basic step, you know? If you do it in Angola, you're never supposed to repeat the same step twice. You know, you're always supposed to move differently. So, you know, you're supposed to bring in elements from candomblé, you know, touch the ground. You, you, you're not supposed to, whereas in some schools of, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of Capoeira Abada, for example, I can see two steps and I know where the person is trained. Because it's the little finger, it's, it's, and it's always the same. There's thousands of people around the world that do exactly the same Jenga. And I think for them, it's actually become a kind of identity. It's become a really powerful symbol of group membership. And they're really quite proud of that allegiance. So I don't knock it. I mean, I think a, a, a normal, normal Angolera would say robot capoeira. <laughs> you know? But I would say really strong group identity. Just, just rock solid group identity. Fierce loyalty to that identity. So that's what I would sort of write it. Maybe it's a positive spin. Yeah. Um, so in terms of these schools of thought, if you're just walking around, let's say I'm walking around Florianopolis, Brazil, or Brasilia, um, are they associated with regions, or what do I see in the street if I'm in a city square on a college campus? On a college campus, you would probably see either Contemporania, which is sort of an attempt to kind of reintegrate some of the traditional stuff back into the Capoeira Hegenal, or you'd probably see a variant of the Senzala movement, which is Capoeira Abada, Senzala, which is, it's, it's not, I, I, don't, I don't say Hegenal, even though these, they would probably say they were Hegenal, because actually they've lost a lot of stuff from what Bimba, that guy, the ball guy, was teaching. Um, they've actually stripped a lot of that and made it more martial arts-like. Like, there's a lot of ritual movements still in Capoeira Hegenal. There's a whole series of throws, for example, that they would do at high levels, which I don't think you'd find anybody in Senzala that would ever attempt one of the balloons that would never do, never do them. So what you're really seeing is kind of two contemporary variants. The only place you're going to see a lot of Angola it's going to be either in, in Bahia, in Salvador, or where you find a really strong link with the black nationalist movements of various sorts. So there's really, they're really linked. And I think um, that's been one of the really powerful things for, for Capoeira Angola, is it's helped them to understand and to motivate their own conservativeness around the practice, because they have a really strong discussion about, we don't want to change. Because if we change, we will become less African, less, you know, less authentic. So, uh, you know, in, in the United States, for example, arguably, Capoeira Angola is quite strong. There's some really incredible schools in Capoeira. I mean, one of the best is in New York. You know, there's great ones here in D.C. Um, and they're almost always linked to political, social, you know, um, liberation movements. So the people are very, you, when you go to a Capoeira weekend with those folks, like, be ready, because you're going to have, like, some hour-long seminars on some really tough topics, you know, because they're going to they're gonna tackle, you know, racism in the black community. They're going to talk about, I mean, uh, sexism in the black community. They're going to talk about, like, identity politics and personal style. They're going to come at you. I mean, I've, I've been seriously chewed out in some of those things, you know, like, but people ask me, why are you here? Because if you don't have a good reason, if you're just a spec, you know, if you're just a passenger, we want to know. And if you say, look, I've got an agenda too, it, that's sort of respectable. So what you're seeing there is probably contemporanea. It, it may be the Senzala movement. The Senzala movement is especially associated with, with um, I would say, almost more of a fighting style. They're, they're pretty <coughs> tough. Um, some of the Berry Bazoo guys and that stuff down in Britain. Yeah. Yeah, you want? You were mentioning uh, in some of the slides how uh, there's, a, there's a lot of diversity in terms of what was going on in slavery back then. You showed the lady who was North African with the slaves next to her. I was trying to understand what was the connection between that and what you were trying to say about neuroscience or about, you know, or were you just saying that things are, you know, it was all confused? And what, what's the connection? What's the connection? Um, the, the connection is, uh, Lori asked me to put some brain in this. No, no, that's not it. Um, <laughs> the, the connection, I think, look, I'm trying to, in some ways, is I think you've got a, um, look, there's, it's, the, the connection is tenuous. Okay, so if you don't feel like you caught it, it's probably because it was weak. Right? It's not because you weren't listening closely. Um, I think for me, what's, what's really important is that I'm trying to capture what that way of life was like and, and focusing on the way of life rather than on the ethnic or racial identity of the people. Because I think it really comes out of that way of life, which is those gangs. And so when these practices come through, to me it's not about flagging which ones are truly African and which ones are introduced from you know, Europeans, but which ones are from that working class way of life. That you know, that tough, mixed race, ex-slave or slave or or vet, you know, in the city, where where is it coming through? So I'm really trying to understand 
the origin of the practice from a particular social setting. And to me, you have to understand those gangs. And the only way to understand those gangs is to understand what was happening in the cities. Yeah, does that make more sense? Yeah, yeah. And I guess the second thing I was kind of getting also, I was thinking about was, you know, you're using the term gangs, yeah. but you're also talking about how it is that everything was very mixed up in that time in terms of the way people get alliances and yeah. you know the gangs were part of the voting structure or they were doing things in the voting structure yeah. doing things for social change and you know that so is that term actually appropriate you know because people name things according to the way they want That's people it. other people see it if yeah. i was being completely historically accurate i would stick with maltas the entire way through i mean i just changed that to sort of help people out and i and i changed two because i think it does it, it shocks us a little to think of you know the word gang associated with you know political parties and, and but that's kind of what was happening so so you're right it's anachronistic for me to call them gangs they really should be called maltas but i would argue that if you're going to translate the term probably the best thing you got is gang and and one of the things i think it challenges on us to ask is you know in the contemporary world in brazil it's the same thing the gangs are actually more complicated than just drug trafficking violent groups they're also providing social services. They're providing loans. They're providing police forces. So I think maybe I'm being a little bit of a, you know, I'm pressing people's buttons on purpose by using the word gang because I want to show that it was complicated then and it's complicated now too. You know, that it's, it's not just these are villains. They're actually social organizations with, with really interesting dimensions and some pretty scary violent ones. So, so you're right, anachronistically, I've just made a major foul. So all the historians in the room, you know, mark me off for that, because you're right, spot on. But that, I, that's how I translate it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I just had a question about, like, why it was illegal. Like, was it people from different gangs coming together really trying to hurt each other in the beginning? Or is it people yeah. from the same gang, like, just having fun? Um, I know they use like, I mean, just mentioned like razor blades and stuff, so I know there's... Yeah, and so it was the violence. They were, I mean, like, there were always waves of repression after there was somebody important got hurt. Like, you know, somebody's wife gets scared and some guy gets stabbed going out of the opera, you know, bang, two years of repression happened, you know. So there's that violence, but there's also just a lot of practices were outlawed because they were viewed as, as kind of dangerous but uncertain why. So um, sometimes drumming was outlawed for periods of time in, in Brazil, all drumming. Um, sometimes religious congregations of any sort that were outside Catholic Church were outlawed. They'd often go in and out, so there'd be a law against it, but then somebody would sort of forget to enforce the law after 10 years, and they sort of drop out, and then they go after something else. But for a while in Brazil, especially in that 19th century, it was really unclear what they should do, the authorities should do, because here a huge portion of their citizenry, or not citizenry, but a huge portion of their free society is African. And they're drumming and they're having their own religious ceremonies, and so what do we do? You know, if we're the light-skinned authorities who are kind of scared of that, how do we make some laws against this? So they started passing laws against things like capoeira. Now it was unclear whether they were, they weren't really just outlawing a game, they were outlawing anybody who is a capoeira. And that's just like saying, I mean, when in Australia we have these, these anti-motorcycle um, anti gang laws, and the problem is always, how do you write a law that bans the group you want to ban without banning the other groups? So they write a law that you can't associate with two other people who have criminal records. And then they end up arresting all kinds of people who are not in gangs because they're associated with, you know, because uncle and their, you know, their cousin are both, and next thing you know, they're, they're arrested for being in a gang because that's the, the technical definition of gang. So they're, they're, the, the law is always trying to find a way to ban what they want to ban as it, as it changes and as it shifts what they're actually, the, is the target of repression. So for a while, drumming was outlawed, Kendra Blay was outlawed, that's the religious beliefs. You know, you get these sort of shifting things, whatever the authorities are afraid of that. Great. Right, well, everybody, Greg um, Downing has a really excellent book um, that talks more about this. If you would like to check it out and know more about what his research has been, Learning Capoeira, Lessons in Cunning from an Afro-Brazilian Art. So, um, you know, check it out and you have somebody to autograph your book while he's here. <laughs> Thank you very much to Greg Downing. Oh. Going to move the chairs aside this way, and uh, see some see the see some disorderliness. Some music, and then we uh, teach a song, so that everyone has a sense for what we're we're trying to do here. I'm your right. All right. <laughs> um, so. <laughs>
So we're just going to start playing music. Um, uh, people, because I, I don't think everyone's on an instrument, if uh, people feel fine, they can play. And then we're going to stop and we're going to teach you a couple capoeira songs so that you can add to the energy. Um, so let's start off. <laughs> 
we go through some of the uh, some of the songs that we were just singing, and you guys can pitch in. You can see what a difference that makes. Uh, we'll probably take one more person off instruments, and then we'll uh, we'll play some more for you. All right. So um, let's start with Bible City. All right. So the chorus for Bible City. So Bible City, come on, Bible City. Chorus for this is Dona Maria, come on, Bible City. All right, so everyone after me. Dona, Dona, Maria, Maria, como, como, va, va, você, você. Dona Maria, Dona Maria, como vai, como vai, você, você. Dona Maria, como vai você? 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 If I don't do things like 50 times, I forget it. <laughs> Let's do it another 45. <laughs> Dona Maria, como vai você? Dona Maria, como vai você? All right. So I'm going to sing other things. I want you to sing Dona Maria como vai você, okay? So, vai você como vai você? Dona Maria como vai você? Vai você como vai você? Dona Maria como vai você? Vai você, vai você? Dona Maria como vai você? Jogo pan meu tiquira pan de. Dona Maria como vai você? Vai você, vai você. Dona Maria, como vai você? Vai você, vai você. Dona Maria, como vai você? Awesome. All right. The next one is much more difficult. Right? <laughs> so I'm gonna say, sing. So bad for me, Shama. And then the chorus is, ay, 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 so bad for me, Shama, ay, 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 so bad for me, Pranja, ay, 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 so bad for me, Sopa, ay, 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 so bad for me, Leva, ay, 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 and bow here, go, go, ay, 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 so bad for me, Shama, ay, 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 so bad for me, Pranja, ay, 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 so bad for me, Shama, ay, 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 all right. And one I was trying to sing earlier, but got swung into a different song. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> so we're gonna do seem, 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 oh now, 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 and then the chorus is oh seem, 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 oh now, 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 oh yes, 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 oh no, no, no. All right. <laughs> so after me, uh, what? So yes is seem. All right. So repeat after me. Seem, seem. All right, good. You got half of it. Now <laughs> the other part is now. All right. So, now means no. So, <coughs> next time someone says, now, 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 it's just like, oh. <laughs> All right, so, now. Now. All right, so, scene. Scene. Now. Now. All right. Oh, scene, scene, scene. Oh, now, now, now. Oh, scene, scene, scene. Oh, now, now, now. All right, now, something you get used to uh, if you ever sing at the front of a hoda, or actually in the, in the crowd here, is, is saying, Oh, or yeah, really loudly, okay? So let's practice that. Oh, oh, awesome. So, oh, scene, 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 oh, now, now, now. 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 Awesome. All right, let's start up again. You guys want help with this? <laughs> Are there any capoeiristas here? Anybody who's ever done any capoeira and wants to join in? Uh, so you guys anybody who has or don't want to come in? Adam Schaefer? <laughs> Not that we're calling you out already. Right? <laughs> okay. You okay with that? Yes. Good talk. <laughs> Slow like that? I'll let you leave the thing. 
Perfectly obvious, right? I have a question, and you might have already talked about this in your lecture, but I got here late. So, what is, how does improvisation um, play into this? Because obviously you're coordinated with each other, but there seems to be a lot of improvisation. So, um, I'll choreograph from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> you plan this out. <laughs> for days in advance. <laughs> We've been training for minutes. <laughs> I, I give you the, sure. I mean, these. When I watch it, what I see is um, is folks um, challenging each other with sort of creating questions and movements, and then the the goal is really to be able to respond fluidly. And if you're asking a harder and harder questions, you are making it harder and harder for them to find <coughs> responses to those movements. So you might think of it as, even though it seems like it's moving constantly. You're actually trying to cut off the other person's options and maneuver them in such a way that, that they, I mean, in a really tough game, somebody might fall down or a trap so you can actually headbutt them in the stomach. I mean, you guys were taking it easy on each other a little. But, but that, there's, there's literally no core, I mean, unless you guys are cheating, there's no choreography. At all. <laughs> no choreography, it's just like a chess game. You just keep making moves and you're trying to get checkmate on the game. But so you it, don't is, be, it is totally improvisational. Yeah, it's right? all free flow. And, and the relationship to music, and we didn't do it too much, but even sometimes with the music, you'll hear somebody call out something. You know? And if you can understand Portuguese, you'll actually understand the commenting on the game. And that'll be completely improvised. So, so for example, at one point, I switched the song to this song, Meu Facão Bateu Baixo, which is actually suggesting somebody, it means my, my machete has cut low, and then the response is, a bananeira caiu, the, the banana tree fell down. So the implication is somebody might have gotten a position where they could have been tricked. <laughs> <laughs> 
meu facão bateu embaixo. And so sort of say, hey, meu facão bateu embaixo. And they're actually commenting on what happened. Or, or you'll hear things in the songs themselves. The person who's doing the solo will change it slightly to comment on what just happened. Um, but if you're watching it closely, you'll see things, little, little quirks, you know? Some didn't work. Or somebody got awful close to getting toppled over the bare and bow. Thank you for not doing that to me. Um, or something like that. So it's all improvised. Now they can breathe. <laughs> <laughs> so what's like the checkmate, like if you're relating it to Jess? When you fall down. <laughs> <laughs> if so you're you fell and I'm still standing, check me. Okay. We go again. <laughs> Reset if, the board. Or if you get into like an <clears throat> awkward position where you don't quite communicate with each other very well. That's a scale, kind of, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's like, I mean, then no one person wins. It's just, oh, look, we kind of did something awkward. Let's try again. I guess the ideal situation is where, you know, I create a puzzle for the other person that's just hard enough that they have to struggle to get out of it. And then um, they do the same thing for me. And those are usually the most fun games to watch. Uh, where, you know, I'm trying my darndest, but only some of my attempts actually cause the other person to fall, but that might not have been my intention. I, the intention might have been just to create a really interesting pu spatial puzzle for the other person to try to get out of. Um, usually you have to be either really close or really fast to do that. <laughs> I think the ultimate game for any Kapolisa would be to have it look like a perfectly choreographed <coughs> fight scene, but it's completely improvised. That would be the penultimate goal. You can throw a kick as fast as you want and they're ready for what they're doing. There's dodges and they're throwing a kick back and you're dodging as well. That's when it gets really pretty is when people can play at that level. So while the goal may be to trap or trip the other person, that may not be what you want out of the game. Was this a particular style of capoeira? Um, there's a bunch of different styles represented here. Um, <coughs> the thing you have to be careful of is that there's just this huge <coughs> spectrum of mm -hmm. capoeiristas, and they all can play with each other, the jogoji capoeira. Um, the um, so I do a, a style called manjinga, which it would probably be I don't know. It's like more of a a fluid, you know. So like trying to trying to bring out the most expression in the game. I'm not sure that I lived up to that, but uh, that's the goal of my style. Manjinga. Um, um, <coughs> Other styles have, have a different cast to it. For example, the Malaise group in the DC area has, has this really, like they train their movements to such extent that their, their movements are all extremely beautiful. But you can tell that their movements, like, you know, they did, <laughs> they did a, a capasso, then they did, you know, a martello, then they did this. And you can tell that there was a dividing line between those. And I've seen some, you know, mestres in the style put together these uh, these amazing array of movements, but again, they look like movements. I was like, I did not know you could put those movements next to each other, but. Mm -hmm. Whereas in my style, it would be sort of like a, oh, I want my leg to go over here. And I want it to look pretty while it does that. <laughs> so uh, I might sort of horribly smear a bunch of things together. Um, what, watching the outside, it's, it's, very, it's a very ecumenical <laughs> style, very open style they're playing to allow people with different, I mean, the rhythm we were playing was actually with Angola. The ch -ch -dong -ding, ch -ch -dong -ding. So it's kind of a bit more slow and, and a bit more thoughtful. It wasn't it's, I mean, I've actually seen Capoeira when it's going, you know, 100 miles an hour. And it's just, you know, and this was a bit more letting the game kind of breathe and give people some space to do something other than just spin around. So I think you guys kind of set a nice pace. That's what I tried to copy when I, when I went in to help. And, and that gave people a chance to do different sorts of stuff. So I'd say to me, it was, a, it was a great game to play with different sorts of groups because it let people do different things in that same rhythm. Now, can anyone here do justice to Asian Al as Bimba? Uh, you know, in, in the, one particular meaning way. if I play his toe, then yeah. you know how like, there's this really, like, I don't know, this, this living beat. Uh, That's a tall one. <laughs> you mean, can we do some kicks? Question? Yeah, sure. Well, I just wanted to know about the belts. I noticed that you have their ropes, or? They, yeah, they use cord and capoeira. 
uh, it's, it's like karate or taekwondo, that's your belt. Um, every group typically has their own cording system. So what is yellow in his group, it might be completely different in my group. Um, so there's been many attempts to unify the cording system, but again, Gakwood is a little disorderly, and they, they don't <laughs> like it, so everybody likes to have their own cording system. Um, but yeah, it's just like any other martial art, you get corded as you go up. Is there a reason why they use cords instead of, I don't know, something else? That I don't know. Does anybody know? Uh, that's kind of a 1970s. I mean, it's an, it's an innovation. A lot of times they're based on the they, colors of the yeah. Brazilian flag. So you see a lot of yellow, blue, green, you know, sort of, because that's the Brazilian flag. Um, and I think a lot of people created this outfit originally, tried to actually copy some of the laborers. I mean, when Carlos Santa talks about it, it's the, he says that this kind of cotton pants was what the guys wore at the docks. And they tied their pants with, they didn't wear belts, they tied their pants with rope. So he sort of says so this is wrong. Right. So some people say it's a it's a commemoration of that you know origin. Um, in 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 line with that, most groups start out with what they call crew, which is like the raw cotton color cord, and then most grand maestres of groups or heads of groups get a pure white cord. So you go from a raw white cord <coughs> to a pure white cord when you're the head of a group. So that's that's holding lineage to that. Um, and I know this. If this takes too long, don't worry about it. <laughs> but What's the relationship between capoeira and candomblé, which is the African mm -hmm. religion? So candomblé is, is, uh, so candomblé is not something that I've ever really done. Um, but it's heavy into drumming um, <coughs> as sort of the ritual aspect. And I believe candomblé is, it's unifying some of the, <coughs> the pagan god of many different African groups and sort of <laughs> reconciling with Christianity in a way. So, mm -hmm. what's that? It's a syncretic religious form. Like when like they were, they were making... Or, say, yeah, but is there any relationship to Capoeira though? Uh, yeah, uh, in the sense that's probably, they pr were probably using the same drums. Um, mm -hmm. That depends on your capoeira group, I would say. A lot of groups are steeped in tradition and even religion. Some groups aren't. Some groups are just about the training and, and the tradition mm -hmm. is just built into their capoeira. Oh. Uh, like he was saying about the styles earlier, um, his is a little amalgamous and uh, free-flowing. Other groups are very rigid. The group I started with had a very <coughs> strict jing, a very strict kicks. You had to play this way, you had to move that way. That's the way you moved. Um, clean, crisp kicks all the time. Other groups don't do that. They, they got the free flow and have a little expression. Some groups take that further and they take that into their own philosophy of the group out into their religion. So some groups are heavily steeped in the folklorist religions. They stick to the many different gods. And uh, even when it comes into the Christianity, they, they worship the different saints. <coughs> but not all groups do that. It, it has some, you know, almost like, you know, you see somebody go to a baseball, uh, to the diamond, and you know, hit, and they do a kiss the cross or something like that. The people who were practicing capoeira were the same people practicing the religion. And there's a lot of, in the songs, you hear them talking about the gods of Fondomblé. You know, the Fondomblé gods were essentially the same gods as the Christian gods or the, the Catholic, Catholic gods, which were the same as the Angola gods, and they mixed them together in a lot of ways because Catholicism was taking over with the colonial times, and they were attempt, attempting to outlaw a lot of the gods of, you know, that the African people brought with them. But so just like Capoeira, they hid the fight inside of a dance, they hid their gods inside of, you know, inside of the Catholic representation. So so Saint Mary represented, you know, this God. And they almost in a lot of ways there was one for ones. Yeah. There's a really interesting division though, in the sense that I mean Capoeira really was male dominated traditionally and Canoble was really female dominated. And so some people argue it's actually kind of they're complementary. Um, that Women's work, the women would dominate the spiritual world because they were the ones who were most talented at receiving the gods, the, 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 the orishas, and the men did this. It's, it's possible. I mean, certain figures is a real close relationship. Like Master Bimba, um, he had four wives actually, but of them, at least one of them was a very famous Maya son who was a mother of saints. So you know, he would he directly had that relationship between the two, and, and his teheru, where his weird practice was also a place where they danced. Kind of like so the two kind of share a space, you might say, and and but I often heard if you look at Ruth Landis books from the 1940s, she says that all the Candomblé women that stay from the Capoeira guys, they're all rascalians and they'll just take you and leave you. So there was a real kind of tension at the same time. The respectable women were in Candomblé and the not respectable men were in 
Capueta. So they, although they kind of shared this space, there was also a bit of tension between the two. So watch out for this Capueta guy. <laughs> How long have each of y'all been doing this? I've been doing seven years. Seven to yeah. I've been about seven. seven. Maybe seven to ten, I don't know. A lot fresher. Um, <laughs> I, I actually never went to school at all. Um, I was just walking around campus my freshman year and I saw a game playing and I didn't feel like doing my homework between classes. So <laughs> that looks so much cooler. Right so, on the quad. Yeah. Sure, your homework, do couple yeah. <laughs> Moral of story. Um, so I, I practiced um, just when I was on the mall with Dan. Um, um, and uh, so that was. Four years, but mostly mostly off, some on, so <laughs> not quite a full four years if you're actually counting the time I was practicing. Most cop leases in America have that story. <laughs> I think I, well, it's been about ten years, but all total maybe six months. <laughs> <laughs> it's been it's been a full year since I played. So today was the first time like a year that I've played. Uh, <laughs> so it'll hurt tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, By maybe I think it was eight years for me, but again off and on, on and off again. Uh, so I don't know, maybe half of it counts. Yeah, I'm the president of the UMD Capoeira Club. So if anybody's interested. <laughs> and thank you all very much yeah. for coming. And so yes, you, you know, University of Maryland Capoeira Club right here. Recruit. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all really thank very much for coming. Yeah. yeah, they actually, they actually sang. Yeah. They sang. Yeah. It's like, that was amazing. Wow. <laughs> and, and we got you fairly close, which is awesome. There's more cookies and food, so.